Vikes win in dramatic fashion again with more fourth quarter magic. So is Kirk Cousins officially Captain Clutch? And just how concerned should you be about Ed Donatel's defense? Plus around the NFL with our What Does It Mean segment. It's all coming up next on Superior Sports Talk. Carol 11 sports anchor Reggie Wilson covers the Twin City sports scene nonstop. Luke Inman is ready to put him on the hot seat. That's camera. what you're going to do to me. Instant analysis. Yanked. Out you go. Post game breakdowns and red hot takes. The Timberwolves need a stick. Reggie and Luke give you a daily dose of Minnesota sports with Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. And it starts now. Back in the lab, Reggie and Luke back at it. Another episode, Superior Sports Talk, presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. It's your daily 30 minute breakdown of everything Minnesota sports, which you can now find streaming on your Roku or Amazon Fire Stick devices. All you got to do is look out for our Locked On Sports Minnesota app there. And that's Reggie Wilson on Twitter at Reggie Wilson TV and on CARE 11. Another victory Monday, Reg. I feel like we're getting spoiled, man. Fourth one already this year, and October's only just started. Yeah, it's, it's uh, good news if you're a Vikings fan, but man, I don't know how many more of these that these fans can take between last year and then starting off this year as well. You're just like, dang, like, can they just win one comfortably? Man, I'm running low on my blood pressure meds, man. But take them <laughs> when you can get them in the NFL. Hey, lots to get into. Remember, follow along on the Locked On Minnesota YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button there and leave us a comment. And on Twitter, give us a follow at Locked On M-I-N. And remember, we're a podcast too. Free and available, all platforms, Spotify, Apple, you name it, we got it. Tons of great choices over there. You got the Ron Johnson show, the football party, the roundtable discussion every Friday, and more. It's your one-stop shop with endless Vikings talk with local experts. Do us a favor, hit the subscribe button, and drop us a five-star review. All right, to football we go. And your Minnesota Vikings win yet again in dramatic come-from-behind fashion. Grab their third division victory already this season, 29-22 mm -hmm. over the Bears, despite the Vikes owning an 18-point lead earlier in that game. Of course, when your quarterback is completing every pass he throws, makes things a little easier. That's exactly what Kirk Cousins did Sunday. Started the game by completing his first 17 passes. That set a new franchise record. Put the team up 21-3 midway through the the second quarter things cooled down after that Chicago rallies they go up 22 21 with nine minutes to play but when you needed him the most he heats back up again leads the team on a game-winning touchdown drive he capped off himself with a quarterback sneak other noteworthy performances Justin Jefferson he's a freak another monster game buck 54 12 catches Cook and Madison teamed up 31 rushes buck 17 on the ground but let's start here Reg Kirk Cousins we haven't gotten that one game with like four straight quarters of consistency but he's growing mm -hmm. this knack now for turning it on late in games when you need a drive so what's the deal at this point when do we start calling comeback Kirk a clutch quarterback or maybe you think he's already there thoughts on Kirk's performance Sunday as a whole and his ability to lead this team back in the fourth quarter once again well, we talked to the guys in the locker room yesterday, and they talked about how they have the utmost confidence in Kirk Cousins' ability to lead them. And, you know, they they pointed to his just unwavering, like, unshakable character out there. It's just like he never gets too high, too low. He's just like a steady guy out there. And I think that kind of calms them down because if he's not panicking – they're not panicking. And as a leader of the offense, it's like, oh, okay. Like if, if he's doing all right, I guess we're good. We're good. We're good. And just this team this year just has this confidence, you know, call it the coaching staff, call it just the new energy on the team winning games when they probably would have lost them under the previous regime. It's just something about their grit that just really just allows them to continue to keep fighting each and every time. And you think about it, you know, we brought it up last night on Vikings Extra on CARE 11. Sometimes you just wonder how many times that you can play with fire until you get burned. But if you look at it, in Kirk Cousins' career, he's had 17 fourth quarter comebacks, 23 game winning drives, three this season. The first one against Detroit brought him back. Last Just last week, <laughs> brought him back. 
and then this week, uh, this past Sunday against Chicago, when the time comes, the dude is just clutch, man. Like he pulls out these throws that, you know, you look at that, that Lions game, some just incredible throws on that last drive last week, that throw with the touch, the deep ball to Justin Jefferson on the sideline on the go route, just a beautiful pass and catch. Like, Kirk Cousins throws one of the best deep balls in the game. Like, I don't think you can debate that. You you put Russell Wilson up there. You put, you know, guys like Mahomes and Herbert up there. And then you got to put Quirky Kirky up there. Captain Kirk out there slinging it around. That His deep ball is, is one of the best in the game, I believe. And it's just interesting. I talked about it last night. He had kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type of a performance in the first half. Just lights out, killing him. Big reason why they went up 21 to three. And then in the second half, I guess the defense just kind of made some adjustments. And in that third quarter, they were lifeless. Like the offense just couldn't do anything. But it's like they still stay within striking distance, even with the 19 straight unanswered from the Bears. They stay within striking distance. And when they needed them the most, how about a 17 play, 75 yard Oof. drive? that he orchestrated to lead them to that touchdown and two-point conversion to go up seven, and they put it in the defense's hands. But it's just kind of crazy. Kirk is just finding this knack. It seems like he has ice water in his veins. The The coaching staff comes up with a great plan in the like the two-minute offense when, when things are, are tight, and Kirk just has a, a good knack of just being able to execute when he needs to, they had like three third down conversions on that one drive alone. And he put the ball where he needed to put him some great passes on that drive. And look, say what you want about Kirk. He can be inconsistent at times. He can be up and down. He did admit yesterday in the press conference, he's still learning and he's still developing in this offense. He said, you know, the last three years in one offense the mastery that he had by the end of last year in that offense that they ran, as opposed to where he is right now, there's still some work to be done, but he feels like they're growing. And look, he knows enough of the offense to put him on those game-winning drives when they need to, and that's encouraging if you're a Vikings fan. Yeah, you said it. Three impressive comebacks in a row. Obviously, you wish they just wouldn't be in those situations every week, especially <laughs> after blowing an 18-point lead. But, Reg, yeah. this is the NFL, man. Last week, 15 of the 16 games were a one-possession outcome. So, mm -hmm. I guess that's just life in the league nowadays. Coaches, GMs, owners, you said you talked to the players. They echoed the same thing. You need a guy you feel confident that can just put his marching boots on, and lead his team down on game-winning drives. I got to think KOC feels like he has that right now with Kirk, no matter what happens moving forward. 78% completion percentage versus the Bears. And what stuck out to me the most by far with Kirk was it was the pre-snap adjustments. It felt like over half mm -hmm. those plays, when he got up to the line, he called an audible or a check, hard counts, checks, the no huddle, up-tempo offense to kind of mm -hmm. keep the Bears from subbing in and out. That's what I was most impressed with because under eight years of Zimmer, there was a real internal battle of who had control of the offense. Mm. And how much did we talk about when they first hired KOC? In this league now, the marriage and relationship between the head coach and the quarterback needs to be a healthy one. It's got to be a good one. And versus the Bears, between KOC's play calls, which you mentioned, I thought were maybe his best we've seen thus far, the pre-snap motion, the window dressing, etc., combined with that Kirk's command of the huddle, the leadership mm -hmm. to adjust the plays when he saw fit, that was the atopic offensively and is what you know should give fans, I think, a lot of optimism that this unit is just really headed in the right direction and the best is still yet to come. Now, defensively, well, hmm. that's a whole nother story here. On one hand, this defense hasn't allowed more than 25 points in a single game yet this season. So that's something to lean on, I guess. But once again, the defense kind of just looked lackluster, underwhelming. Gumby again, soft and bendy. 22 points to the Bears isn't great, but the more you dissect it, 
the worse it actually looks. The Bears only had eight drives. Vikings allowed them to score on five of those eight, and they only stopped the Bears one time in the second half. That was on the final drive. So I know the A topic this week is this team's 4-1. and one. They're atop the division. That's all great. But they haven't really won a game convincingly yet, and this defense really feels like a major work in progress that won't be able to hold up against playoff caliber teams as it stands now. So I don't know. Talk me up the ledge here, Reg. What's your takeaways from this defense Sunday? Is there any hope here they can continue to get better? So I posed the question on Twitter yesterday, and I asked, are the Vikings for real? The record says four and one, but do you think the Vikings are for real? And so many people talked about the defense being a problem. We do a segment on Vikings Extra every Sunday called Take 11, where fans sum up the day in 11 words. And a lot of those words were pointed at the defense, like the defense didn't, didn't you know, inspire, but they got the win. A win is a win. And I think that's something that is a bit concerning. It seems like they start strong, and then as the game goes along, they just kind of wear down. And that was the case yesterday. The defense played good enough for them to get out to that 21-3 lead. They have the bad punt. The Bears are just like, hey, look, we ain't got nothing to lose. Let's let it go. Let's let it rip. They seem to find something on offense, up, you know, leading to that halftime. And it was just like, all right, here we go. And it seemed like yesterday, if there were more minutes to be played, in that game, doom was coming. <laughs> like it just felt like they were grand in that on that last drive. You know, you talk. We talked to Cam Dansler. They were like, "Look, we were confident that we were going to be able to stop them, if not on that play where Cam ripped that ball from his former teammates' uh, hands in Amir Smith Marset." Just an aside. Bad day for him in mm -hmm. his return to Minnesota. Like. Just a bad day. For one, Jalen Rager scored. The guy that replaced him, he scored his first touchdown in purple. Woof. Then the play that springs Justin Fields that would have been a 52-yard <sighs> touchdown run, he got called for an illegal block in the back. Got to bring it back. They get a field goal out of it. And then he gets the ball ripped out of his hands from Cam Dantzler to basically end the game. It was like a walk-off rip-off. It's just like, dude, he probably doesn't want to come back to Minnesota anytime soon. <laughs> just a regrettable day for him. But if that, that rip-out play from Cam Dantzler doesn't happen, man, they had some momentum going. It would have been tough to actually score a touchdown on that drive because they needed to actually score a touchdown. Mm -hmm. A field goal just wasn't going to do. And maybe Amir Smith Marset just got a little bit too greedy because he could have just gone out of bounds there. But you felt like they were building something. And, you know, you play that bend but don't break style. And you come up with a takeaway like that. And you're like, well, we didn't break. We, we were, as I've said many times before, mighty bendy. Mighty bendy there. But they did not break because of that takeaway right there at the end. But it is kind of concerning, man. You know, we talked about it going in. Don't allow Justin Fields to get some confidence. And he did. You know, that play that he threw down the sideline to Darnell Mooney when Mooney just like Oof. one hand grabbed that thing, like that was that was impressive. And those were the type of plays that would give a young quarterback confidence. And Fields didn't necessarily have a rough day yesterday. He had actually a pretty solid day. When you look at the numbers, his quarterback rating was higher than Kirk Cousins <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> and so when you look at the defense, you're like, what are you guys doing? Like, you know, you you kind of made this offense that that really looked out of sorts for most of this season look like a decent offense. And that is concerning because you look at, you know, you, you got guys that are that are talented, you know, you expected them to maybe get a little bit more sacks than they did. You know, Zadarius got on the board. Daniil got on the board yesterday. But you were kind of expecting a little bit more production from the edge department, as they call themselves. And then in the defensive backfield, 
what happened to, you know, some of these ball hawking plays? There were no takeaways yesterday. Put some pressure on Justin Fields, make him throw you the football instead of his own guys. That's not happening enough. They're not getting a whole lot of takeaways. I know in the previous regime, they would be upset at that. I'm not really sure what's going on with this defense, but something is not clicking and you keep playing with fire, you're going to get burned. They got burned terribly in the game against Philly. I just feel like you get a, a team that is much more competent. You know, I'm looking at the schedule and I'm looking at, you know, the, the Cardinals game. You know, I'm looking at the the Buffalo game and I'm like, uh, okay, you get some of these more competent offenses against this defense and it's, it might be scary hours. Yeah, I, I'm still not sure how much is just coming down to lack of talent and how much is just Ed Donatel, his scheme, his play calls, his personnel. You've got third and long versus one of the worst offensive lines in the league. And instead of attacking with Daniil Hunter, one of the best pass rushers in the business, you drop him back into coverage and let Cole Komet beat you for a huge down. Now, I'm cherry picking a little bit, but it's the little things like that that are frustrating fans right now good news is it does feel correctable. Donatel said last week in his presser, the guys who have made the switch like Hunter from the 4-3 to the 3-4 in the league, their first month or two usually looks like this. And I know Hunter got a cleanup sack Sunday, but overall, like you mentioned, just hasn't had the impact we thought he would. So you just hope these things, you can correct them, you can adjust moving forward. And like KOC's done on offense, finding ways to maximize your best players putting them in the best positions to succeed. That means rushing Hunter and Zedarius and want them on third and long, not dropping them back into zone. Fields, by the way, missed just one pass in the second half. One. And mm. I'm not going to lie, man. First time I really got to sit down and watch the kid do his thing. Certainly saw the flashes of why he was drafted so high between the arm and the feet. Looked like that Ohio State Justin Fields we saw coming out. Watch out, man. If they ever surround him with some serious talent or playmakers, Bears may have something there off Offensively. More Vikes, Bears talkers to get into. Reg, who is the unsung hero of the game in your eyes? Like Kirk and JJ, they get all the love and spotlight as they should. Was there another mm -hmm. more under the radar guy, though, that really was maybe a big catalyst in the Vikings' victory? Wasn't under the radar by any means, but I think the duo of Cook and Madison mm -hmm. really, really show well, especially Dalvin Cook. Still elusive, that 100-yard game, still elusive. And I think he was a little disappointed that he didn't get there. But Dalvin was doing some great things on the ground yesterday. And he got in the end zone twice. And he was a big reason why this team was able to do what they were doing off the play action. You know, some of the, the naked boots and, and things like that. Because he was keeping the defense honest with some of the run plays. And if you look at it, like the, the run blocking wasn't the greatest mm -hmm. yesterday. Some of those runs were kind of all Dalvin, just making things happen in a vacuum, in a, in a phone booth, in a tight space, making guys miss and doing what he does. He was running like a Cadillac yesterday. I always say, like, the dude just runs smooth. And he gets in the end zone twice. And I think that's something that, they wanted to continue to try to to get going is the run game. They've been trying really hard at it. Sometimes, you know, they're they're a little predictable with when they call a run, but he was able to keep them from some of those like long and distance uh third downs that, you know, too easily falter them too easily falter them on mm -hmm. offenses. So I if if you give me an unsung hero, I'll definitely go Dalvin Cook in that run game yesterday. So glad you brought them up. Dantzler, eight tackles for a cornerback. Eight tackles. Shut down that Impressive. huge two-point conversion late in the game. And then, of course, already mentioned it, the winner to seal it, the strip on ISM. After he got bullied and stiff-armed to the ground, almost similar to mm -hmm. like the Chris Boyd strip last week versus the Saints. Kind of overshot the play, got back up. Great hustle on that play. I'm going to go with KOC, though. That play calling, mm. man, masterclass in offensive yeah. coaching. Again, the pre-snap motion. I don't know what the percentage was, but had to be nearly 50, 60% of the plays. Someone was moving around before the snap. Jefferson motioning mm -hmm. into the backfield twice. Soak up that attention to get other guys open. A few trick plays like the J.J. to Cook lateral for a big game. 
I just Mm -hmm. thought he was firing on all cylinders yesterday. Vikings offense, 12 of 15 on third down and cashed in on all four red zone trips with four touchdowns. That was huge. That was something that we nitpicked a lot through the first four games, not punching the ball in when you got down there. Cook and Madison combo was solid, as you mentioned, but KOC, I just thought, kind of the brainchild behind it all. So he's my unsung hero from week five. Quick look ahead now at Miami next week, probably no Teddy. Sounds like 50-50 you'll get Tua, which obviously makes the world a difference going from the starter or the third stringer in Skylar Thompson. But then you get Mm -hmm. your bye week, which is great. Vikes, by the way, I believe the first and only team to win their first game after a London trip that didn't yep. lead straight into a bye week. Coming out of that, you've got at home versus Arizona and then on the road versus Washington. They're four and one now. How do you think these next four weeks kind of forecast for the Vikes? You know, I, I mentioned it yesterday. It seemed like after the first few weeks that them going to Miami was going to be rough. And you know mm-hmm. what? The defense is still solid, so it still can be a little bit of a rough one for them depending on who plays quarterback, though, is mm-hmm. is a big determining factor on, you know. But what's interesting is, like, when when the the Vikings, you know, play a backup or third string or, you know, whatever quarterback, things tend to get, like, wacky, man. Things tend to get kind of crazy. And so I, I think, you know, you really want to see them take it to a team and just, like, put them out of their misery early. It's kind of like you said, though, is like the NFL, there's just so much parity right now that, you know, like the the 29 nothing win by the Patriots over the Lions yesterday was just like kind of what you're like, whoa, like what, what, like, you know, that those type of games aren't supposed to happen. Even, you know, earlier in the season, I think it was week two, you know, uh, Baltimore went up crazy on the Dolphins and the Dolphins ended up coming back and winning that game and beating them. It, when Baltimore just looked all world in that game and it's just like, wow, like this is, this is a different beast. You know, the talent in the league is quite talented to put it, you know, lightly. And I think that's something that allows these teams to always fight and never have a quit mentality. But I think the, the, the schedule is favorable. You look at, you know, the Dolphins, that's a winnable game. You look at Arizona, that's a winnable game. You look at the Commanders, they're a bit out of sorts. That's a winnable game as well. I think that they have a great probability in a lot of these games coming up until they get to Buffalo. Buffalo is going to obviously be the toughest game that they'll play this season, you know, going into the playoffs, I believe. And so that's going to be an interesting deal, but I do think that these next three games at least are winnable. It's just a matter of which Vikings team are we going to see? Are we going to see a team that, you know, puts it together for the first half and then the second half goes silent and, you know, then all of a sudden they're playing catch up? Are we finally going to see a Vikings team that can put it together for four straight quarters? Yeah, worst case, you're sitting at four and two going into the bye, which is probably still exceeding people's expectations before the season started. So kind of playing with house money, it feels like next week going into Miami. A bit. The week of rest is huge, too. After a long London trip, yesterday, mm-hmm. a handful of guys got banged up like a Caleb Evans and Ty Chandler. Andrew mm-hmm. Booth still a no-show. And now I kind yeah. of wouldn't be surprised if they just let him sit out until after the bye. And then mm-hmm. two teams out of the bye that you probably look at and probably say are very winnable games. And if you want to continue to be taken seriously, Seriously, in this league, you got to go win the games you're supposed to win. Getting the Cardinals at home out of the bye is ideal. And then a Washington mm-hmm. team that's just really struggling right now with Carson Wentz. With the way this team's playing, the ability to win close games, 6-2 and two record isn't out of the realm of possibilities. And just imagine the national buzz around this team then, man. That's fun to think about. Plenty more exactly. Vikings NFL talk to get into next. We're getting into our What Does It Mean segment. But first, Vikes Super Bowl odds moved to 14-1 to one after their win. And last week, Vegas had the Dolphins favored by one point versus the Vikes. Obviously, the availability of Tua Tagaloa will be a major factor in this one. So be sure to keep tabs and check those odds out and more with Bet Online. BetOnline.net, fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Stats, news, info, you want it. 
They got it. NFL, NBA, even MMA and UFC. Bet Online makes betting easy and is your number one source for all your betting needs. Go to betonline.net today to learn more. That's betonline.net. It's where the game starts. And remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Sam and Ron talk football every day on the Ron Johnson Show. Reggie Wilson gives you a sports anchor's perspective right here on Superior Sports Talk. And the Minnesota Football Party brings together the top Vikings podcasters in the city. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcasts. Drop us a five-star review or find our videos on the Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. And find us streaming on your Roku or Amazon Fire Stick devices. Look out for our Locked On Sports Minnesota app there as well. All right. Time has come. Favorite segments here called What Does It Mean? Let's just jump right into it. First one, what does it mean? Packers dropped to 3-2, and two, lost to the Giants in London thanks to zero points scored in the second half. Rodgers was shut down at the goal line with time expiring on back-to-back -back incompletions to end the game. What does it mean for the Packers and their offense who remain stagnant? Kind of a shell of their former self we've grown accustomed to over the years. Are you worried if you're a Packer fan right now? Probably. But who cares? You know, they, they uh, you know, they <laughs> look, they made their decision. You know, they paid Aaron Rodgers 50 million of those things and, you know, decided not to bring back Devontae, traded him to Las Vegas. Like, you know, they put their trust in Aaron. Bold move, Cotton. Also very <laughs> overconfident in your quarterback that, you know, it's just like, look, we got Aaron Rodgers. We'll figure the rest out. Like, no, like, you, you actually do need some guys that are going to go out there and beat man coverage. Some guys that are going going to go out there and get open. You look at the St. Uh, ooh, I was about to call them the St. Louis Rams. They're, they're long gone <laughs> in those days. But you look at those Rams um, right now. All they have is Cooper Cup. If they didn't have Cooper Cup, you know, even as atrocious as that offense looks, they would, they would look terrible. You know, mm -hmm. you look at Minnesota. Mm -hmm. What they did in the first half with Justin Jefferson, he looked like he was on pace for like 90 catches and 1,000 yards just <laughs> yesterday alone. And you kind of have to have that go-to guy, that alpha receiver that you can go out there and make a play with when chips get down. Like how many times have we seen Rodgers hit Devontae Adams in a big moment of a game? He just doesn't have that guy. You know, I know Romeo Dobbs is emerging. You know, Christian Watson. You know, you tweeted out, I think it was last week or the week before, how before the, the season started, the prediction was, you know, hey, Christian, Christian Watson could be a dynamic player if he holds mm -hmm. on to the ball. And it was just like, dang, like, how did he know? <laughs> how did he know? And it, it's, it's just interesting to see those things play out because, yeah, when you have a, a bona fide quarterback like an Aaron Rodgers, you do just kind of have this confidence that everything is going to be all right. But you, when you, you know, couple that with he's got to build a rapport with brand new guys, you know, one of the, the only holdovers being Randall Cobb and, and, you know, Alan Lazard and Alan Lazard, you know, God bless him, but he's not Devontae Adams, despite Rogers wanting to put him in the hall of fame. It's just crazy. They put the, the, Packers game on the the big screen yesterday at U.S. Bank Stadium, and fans were cheering for their demise, like the Vikings just scored. Like you would have thought that I was like, wait, did I miss something? You know, they're, they're playing the horn and everything. I'm like, wow, like this is crazy. The Packers, they got some stuff going on, man. I feel like they're in trouble a little bit, and them just having Aaron Rodgers is not enough. They have to have a little bit more synergy on offense. Packers did score technically a safety in the second half. Again, though, the offense just sputtering right now. Their next four games, New York Jets, Washington, at Buffalo, at Detroit. You got to think mm -hmm. they should be able to win three of those. Although the Jets right now, New York Jets, holy smokes, they're no gimme like they used to be. And I'm not going to bet against Aaron Rodgers in that offense. I'm sure eventually they'll figure it out. The question is, how long does it take? Because if it takes exactly. too much longer here, you're already in week six coming up. Uh, could mm -hmm. be too little, too late. All right, next one up. The Pittsburgh Steelers, they're 0-8 without T.J. Yikes. Watt in the lineup, getting <laughs> crushed, just smoked by the Bills yesterday, 38-3. to What does it mean when it comes to the stark reality? The Steelers may not be able to win without Watt on the field. Can the Steelers win if T.J. Watt is not healthy and out there? 
So here's the thing. I, we know how dynamic of a player T.J. Watt is. We know from week one, that dude was just ridiculous against the Bengals in that first week. Like, really the biggest reason why they won that game because Mitch didn't do a whole lot and didn't do a whole lot. I think their problem is their offense. They go from Mitch Trubisky to Kenny Pickett. Really didn't do much. Like, And I don't think it's a, oh, they just don't have the right quarterback. I think it's... You know, they've been trying to do the same things on offense for years now. And I think it's just kind of stale. They need some more creativity. I feel like in this league where the NFL is is going on offense, they're zigging, the Steelers are zagging. And you can't just put it on one guy being the reason why they aren't winning football games. Because they are, they have had chances in the last several weeks without TJ Watt to win these football games, but they just are not doing what they need to do. You know, the, the defense itself usually is playing well. Like yesterday, good Lord, Gabe Davis, Josh Allen was cooking those guys. Like I think Josh Allen had 349 yards and four touchdowns in the first half. I know if T.J. Watt is there, maybe things are a little bit different because he's just that disruptive. But at the same time, like, the offense couldn't even keep up with that. Like, they were going out there. They scored the, I think it was a 98-yard touchdown with Gabe Davis, gave it back to the offense. The offense couldn't do a, a thing. They got some problems right now, and there's more than just T.J. Watt. Um, just a very interesting division uh, that's very entertaining to watch from afar as a Viking fan. All right, that's a wrap today. Back tomorrow, breaking down more Vikes, NFL, and T-Wolves. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And join us every day for another episode with your 30-minute breakdown of everything Minnesota sports. We're a podcast, too. Free and available. All platforms. Subscribe. Drop us a five-star review. And now find us streaming on your Roku or Amazon Fire. Fire Stick devices. You just got to look out and download for our Locked On Sports Minnesota app there as well. That's the man, Reggie Wilson, on Twitter at Reggie Wilson TV. Check him out every night up on Care 11. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman. Special thanks to our producer, Matt the Brits. Tune in tomorrow to Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. For Reggie, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, I'm signing out. Be blessed. Spread love this week.